The Doctrine of Repentance by Thomas Watson, first published in 1668, as read by Samantha Ellisay, Tape 4. 7. Revenge A true penitent pursues his sins with a holy malice. He seeks the death of them as Samson was avenged on the Philistines for his two eyes. He uses his sins as the Jews used Christ. He gives them gall and vinegar to drink. He crucifies his lusts. Galatians 5.24 A true child of God seeks to be revenged most of those sins which have dishonored God most. Cranmer, who had with his right hand subscribed the popish articles, was revenged on himself. He put his right hand first into the fire. This happened as he was burned at the stake in Oxford in 1536. David did by sin defile his bed. Afterwards, by repentance, he watered his bed with tears. Israel had sinned by idolatry, and afterwards they did offer disgrace to their idols. Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver. Isaiah 30, verse 22. Mary Magdalene had sinned in her eye by adulterous glances, and now she will be revenged on her eyes. She washes Christ's feet with her tears. She had sinned in her hair. It had entangled her lovers. Now she will be revenged on her hair. She right wipes the Lord's feet with it. The Israelite women who had been dressing themselves by the hour and had abused their looking glasses to pride, afterwards by way of revenge as well as zeal, offered their looking glasses to the use and service of God's tabernacle. Exodus 38, verse 8. So those conjurers who used curious arts or magic, as it is in the Syriac, when once they repented, brought their books and by way of revenge burned them. Acts 19:19. 19, 19. These are the blessed fruits and products of repentance, and if we can find these in our souls, we have arrived at that repentance which is never to, re to be repented of. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 A necessary caution. Such as have solemnly repented of their sins, let me speak to them by way of caution. Though repentance be so necessary and excellent as ye have heard, yet take heed that you do not ascribe too much to repentance. The papists are guilty of a double error. 1. They make repentance a sacrament. Christ never made it so. And who may institute sacraments but he who can give virtue to them? Repentance can be no sacrament because it lacks an outward sign. A sacrament cannot properly be without a sign. 2. The papists make repentance meritorious. They say it does ex congruo, altogether fittingly, merit pardon. This is a gross error. It, indeed, repentance fits us for mercy. As the plow, when it breaks up the ground, fits it for the seed, so when the heart is broken up by repentance, it is fitted for remission. But it does not merit it. God will not save us without repentance, nor yet for it. Repentance is a qualification, not a cause. I grant repenting tears are precious. They are, as Gregory said, the fat of the sacrifice. As Basil said, who was one of the fathers of the 4th century, also known as Basil the Great, the medicine of the soul. And as Bernard said, that is, Bernard of Clairvaux of the 12th century, the wine of angels. But yet, tears are not satisfactory for sin. We drop sin with our tears, therefore they cannot satisfy. Augustine said, well, I have read of Peter's tears, but no man ever read of Peter's satisfaction. Christ's blood only can merit pardon. We please God by repentance, but we do not satisfy him by it. To trust to our repentance is to make it a savior. Though repentance helps to purge out the filth of sin, yet it is Christ's blood that washes away the guilt of sin. Therefore do not idolize repentance. Do not rest upon this, that your heart has been wounded for sin, but rather that your Savior has been wounded for sin. When ye have wept, say with him, Lord Jesus, wash my tears in thy blood. Comfort for the repenting sinner Let me in the next place speak by way of comfort. Christian, 
Has God given you a repenting heart? Know these three things for your everlasting comfort. 1. Your sins are pardoned. Pardon of sin circumscribes blessedness with it. Psalm 32, 1. Whom God pardons, he crowns. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who crowneth thee with loving kindnesses. Psalm 103, verse 3 and 4. A repenting condition is a pardoned condition. Christ said to that weeping woman, Thy sins which are many are forgiven. Luke 7, verse 47. Pardons are sealed upon soft hearts. O you whose head has been a fountain to weep for sin, Christ's side will be a fountain to wash away sin. Zechariah 13, 1. Have you repented? God looks upon you as if you had not offended. He becomes a friend, a father. He will now bring forth the best robe and put it on you. God is pacified towards you and will, with the father of the prodigal, fall upon your neck and kiss you. Sin in scripture is compared to a cloud, Isaiah 44:22. No sooner is this cloud scattered by repentance than pardoning love shines forth. Paul, after his repentance, obtained mercy. I was bestrode with mercy, 1 Timothy 1.16. When a spring of repentance is open in the heart, a spring of mercy is open in heaven. 2. God will pass an act of oblivion. He so, forgets, he so forgives sin as he forgets. I will remember their sin no more, Jeremiah 31.34. Have you been penitentially humbled? The Lord will never upbraid you with your former sins. After Peter wept, we never read that Christ upbraided him with his denial of him. God has cast your sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7:19. How? Not as cork, but as lead. The Lord will never in a judicial way account for them. When he pardons, God is as a creditor that blots the debt out of his book. Isaiah 43, verse 25 Some ask the question whether the sins of the godly shall be mentioned at the last day. The Lord said he will not remember them, and he is blotting them out. So if their sins are mentioned, it shall not be to their prejudice, for the debt book is crossed. 3. Conscience will now speak peace. Oh, the music of conscience! Conscience is turned into a paradise. And there, a Christian sweetly solaces himself and plucks the flowers of joy. 2 Corinthians 1.12 The repenting sinner can go to God with boldness in prayer and look upon him not as a judge, but as a father. He is born of God and is heir to a kingdom. Luke 6 verse 20 He is encircled with promises. He no sooner shakes the tree of the promise, but some fruit falls. To conclude, the true penitent may look on death with comfort. His life has been a life of tears, and now at death all tears shall be wiped away. Death shall not be a destruction, but a deliverance from gale. Thus you see what great comforts remain, what great comfort remains for repenting sinners. Luther said that before his conversion he could not endure that bitter word repentance, but afterwards he found much sweetness in it. Chapter 10 The Removing of the Impediments to Repentance Before I lay down the expedients and means conducive to repentance, I shall first remove the impediments. In this great city, that is London, when you lack water, you search the cause, whether the pipes are broken or stopped, that the current of water is hindered. Likewise, when no water of repentance comes, though we have the conduit pipes of ordinances, see what the cause is. What is the obstruction that these penitential waters do not run? There are ten impediments to repentance. 1. Men do not apprehend that they need repentance. They thank God that all is well with them, and they know nothing of, and they know nothing they should repent of. Thou sayest, I am rich and have need of nothing. Revelations 3.17 He who apprehends not any distemper in his body will not take the physic prescribed. This is the mischief sin has done. It has not only made us sick, but senseless. When the Lord bade the people return to him, they answered stubbornly, Wherein shall we return? Malachi 3 verse 7 
So when God bids men repent, they say, Wherefore should we repent? They know nothing they have done amiss. There is surely no disease worse than that which, ap- which is apoplectical. Footnote. Apoplexy is a malady, sudden in its attack, which arrests the powers of sense and motion. End of footnote. Two. People conceive it an easy thing to repent. It is but saying a few prayers, a sigh, or a Lord have mercy, and the work is done. This conceit of the easiness of repentance is a great hindrance to it. That which makes a person bold and adventurous in sin must needs obstruct repentance. This opinion makes a person bold in sin. The angler can let out his line as far as he will and then pull it in again. Likewise, when a man thinks he can lash out in sin as far as he will and then pull in by repentance when he pleases, this must needs embolden him in wickedness. But to take away this false conceit of the easiness of repentance, consider first, a wicked man has a mountain of guilt upon him, and is it easy to rise up under such a weight? Is salvation per saltum, that is, obtained with a leap? Can a man jump out of sin into heaven? Can he leap out of the devil's arms into Abraham's bosom? Consider second, if all the power in a sinner be employed against repentance, then repentance is not easy. All the faculties of a natural man join issue with sin. I have loved strangers and after them will I go. Jeremiah 2 verse 25 A sinner will rather lose Christ in heaven than his lust. Death, which parts man and wife, will not part a wicked man and his sins. And is it so easy to repent? The angel rolled away the stone from the sepulchre, but no angel, only God himself, can roll away the stone from the heart. 3. Presuming thoughts of God's mercy. Many suck poison from this sweet flower. Christ, who came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15, is accidentally the occasion of many a man's perishing. Though to the elect he is the bread of life, yet to the wicked he is a stone of stumbling. 1 Peter 2.8 To some his blood is sweet wine, to others the water of Merah. Some are softened by this sun of righteousness. Malachi 4.2 Others are hardened. Oh, says one, Christ has died. He has done all for me. Therefore I may sit still and do nothing. Thus they suck death from the tree of life and perish by a Savior. So I may say of God's mercy, it is accidentally the cause of many a one's ruin. Because of mercy men presume and think they may go on in sin, but should a, cle- should a king's clemency make his subjects rebel? The psalmist says, There is mercy with God that he may be feared. Psalm 130 verse 4 But not that we may sin. Can men expect mercy by provoking justice? God will hardly show those mercy who sin, because mercy abounds. 4. A supine sluggish temper Repentance is looked upon as a tedious thing, and such as requires much industry, and men are settled upon their lees and care not to stir. They had rather go sleeping to hell than weeping to heaven. A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom. Proverbs 19.24 He will not be at the labor of smiting on his breast. Many will rather lose heaven than ply the oar and row thither upon the waters of repentance. We cannot have the world citra pulverum, that is, without labor and diligence. And would we have that which is more excellent? Sloth is the cancer of the soul. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep. Proverbs 19.15 It is a witty fiction of the poets that when Mercury had cast Argus into a sleep and with an enchanted rod closed his eyes, then he killed him. When Satan has by his witcheries lulled men asleep in sloth, then he destroys them. Some report that while the crocodile sleeps with its mouth open, the Indian rat gets into its belly and eats up its entrails. So while men sleep in security, they are devoured. 5. The Tickling Pleasure of Sin Who had pleasure in unrighteousness? 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 12 
Sin is a sugar draught mixed with poison. The sinner thinks there is, no, there is danger in sin, but there is also delight, and the danger does not terrify him as much as the delight bewitches him. Plato, who was one of the greatest of Greek philosophers in the 4th century BC, calls love of sin a great devil. Delighting in sin hardens the heart. In true repentance there must be a grieving for sin. But how can one grieve for that which he loves? He who delights in sin can hardly pray against it. His heart is so inveigled with sin that he is afraid of leaving it too soon. Samson dota, doted on Delilah's beauty, and her lap proved his grave. When a man rolls iniquity as a sugared lump under his tongue, it infatuates him and is his death at last. Delight in sin is a sil silken halter. Will it not be bitterness in the latter end? 2 Samuel 2, verse 26. 6. An opinion that repentance will take away our joy. But that is a mistake. It does not crucify but clarify our joy and takes it off from the fulsome leaves, leaves of sin. What is all earthly joy? It is but hilarious insania, that is, a pleasant frenzy. Among false joys we drive away the night, says Virgil. Worldly mirth is but like a feigned laugh. It has sorrow following at the heels. Like the magician's rod, it is instantly turned into a serpent. But divine repentance, like Samson's lion, has a honeycomb in it. God's kingdom consists as well in joy as in righteousness. Romans 14.17 None are so truly cheerful as penitent ones. There is a kind of satisfaction in weeping, says Ovid. The oil of joy is poured chiefly into a broken heart. The oil of joy for mourning, Isaiah 61, 3. The fields In the fields near Palermo grow a great many reeds in which there is a sweet juice from which sugar is made. Likewise, in a penitent heart, which is the bruised reed, grow the sugared joys of God's Spirit. God turns the water of tears into the juice of the grape, which exhilarates and makes, the, makes glad the heart. Who should rejoice if not the repenting soul? He is heir to all the promises, and is not that matter for joy? God dwells in a contrite heart, and must there not needs be joy there? I dwell with him that is of a contrite spirit, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57 verse 15 Repentance does not take away a Christian's music, but raises it a note higher and makes it sweeter. 7. Another obstacle to repentance is despondency of mind. It is a vain thing for me, says the sinner, to set upon repentance. My sins are of that magnitude that there is no hope for me. Return ye now every one from his evil way. And they said, There is no hope. Jeremiah 18, verse 11 and 12. Our sins are mountains, and how shall these ever be cast into the sea? Where unbelief represents sin in its bloody colors and God in his judge's robes, the soul would soon, sooner fly from him than to him. This is dangerous. Other sins need mercy, but despair rejects mercy. It throws the cordial of Christ's blood on the ground. Judas was not damned only for his treason and murder, but it was his distrust of God's mercy that destroyed him. Why should we entertain such hard thoughts of God? He has bowels of love to repenting sinners. Joel 2.13 Mercy rejoices over justice. God's anger is not so hot, but mercy can cool it, nor so sharp, but mercy can sweeten it. God counts his mercy his glory. Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19 We have some drops of mercy ourselves, but God is the Father of mercies. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 Who begets all the mercies that are in us. He is the God of tenderness and compassion. No sooner do we mourn than God's heart melts. No sooner do our tears fall than God's repentings kindle. Hosea 11 8 Do not say then that there is no hope. Disband the army of your sins and God will sound a retreat to his judgments. Remember, Great sins have been swallowed up in the sea of God's infinite compassions. Manasseh made the streets run with blood, 
yet when his head was a fountain of tears, God grew propitious. 8. Hope of impunity. Men flatter themselves in sin and think that God, having spared them all this while, never intends to punish. But because the assizes are put off, therefore, surely there will be no assizes. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten, he hideth his face, he will never see it. Psalm 10, verse 11. The Lord indeed is long-suffering towards sinners, and would by his patience bribe them to repentance, but here is their wretchedness. Because he forbears to punish, they forbear to repent. No, that the lease of patience will soon run out. There is a time when God will say, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Genesis 6 verse 3 A creditor may forbear his debtor, but forbearance does not excuse the payment. God takes notice how long the glass of his patience has been running. I gave her space to repent, and she repented not. Revelation 2 verse 21 Jezebel added impenitence to her incontinency, and what followed? Behold, I will cast her into a bed, Revelation 2, verse 22, not a bed of pleasure, but a bed of languishing, where she will consume away in her iniquity. The longer God's arrow is drawing, the deeper it will wound. Sins against patience will make a man's hell so much the hotter. 9. The next impediment impediment of repentance is fear of reproach if I repent I shall expose myself to men's scorns the heathen could say when you apply yourself to the study of wisdom prepare for sarcasms and reproaches but consider well who they are that reproach you they are such as are ignorant of God and spiritually frantic that is ragingly mad delirious and insanely foolish are And are you troubled to have them reproach you, who are not well in their wits? Who minds a madman laughing at him? What do the wicked reproach you for? Is it because you repent? You are doing your duty. Bind their reproaches as a crown about your head. It is better that men should reproach you for repenting than that God should damn you for not repenting. If you cannot bear a reproach for religion, never call yourself Christian. Luther said, Christianus quasi Christianus, as Christian is as if a cruci- a Christian is as if a crucified one. Suffering is a saint's livery, and alas, what are reproaches? They are but chips off the cross, which are rather to be despised than laid to heart. Ten. The last impediment of repentance is immoderate love of the world. No wonder Ezekiel's hearers were hardened in rebellion when their hearts went after covetousness. Ezekiel 33, verse 31 The world so engrosses men's time and bewitches their affections that they cannot repent. They had rather put gold in their bag than tears in God's bottle. I have read of the Turks that they give heed to neither churches nor altars, but are diligent in looking after their tillage. Likewise, many scarcely ever heed to repentance. They are more for the plow and breaking of clods than breaking up the fallow ground of their hearts. The thorns choke the word. We read of those who were invited to Christ's supper who put him off with worldly excuses. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, etc. Luke 14, verse 18 and 19. The farm and the shop so take up people's time that they have no leisure for their souls. Their golden weights hinder their silver tears. There is an herb in the country of Sardinia like balm, which if they eat much of will make them die laughing. Such an herb, or rather weed, is the world, if men eat too immoderately of it. Instead of dying repenting, they will die laughing. These are the obstructions to repentance, which much which must be removed so that the current may be clearer chapter 11 prescribing some means for repentance 1 serious consideration in the last place i shall prescribe some rules or means conducive to repentance 
the first means conducive to repentance, is serious consideration. I thought on my ways and turned my feet into thy testimonies. Psalm 119.59 The prodigal, when he came to himself, seriously considered his riotous luxuries, and then he repented. Peter, when he thought of Christ's words, wept. There are certain things which, if they were well considered of, would be a means to make us break off a course of sinning. Firstly, consider seriously what sin is, and sure enough there is enough evil in it to make us repent. There are in sin these twenty evils. 1. Every sin is a recession from God. Jeremiah 2 verse 5 God is the supreme good, and our blessedness lies in union with Him. But sin, like a strong bias, draws away the heart from God. The sinner takes his leave of God. He bids farewell to Christ and mercy. Every step forward in sin is a step backward from God. They have forsaken the Lord. They are gone backward. Isaiah 1.4 The further one goes from the sun, the nearer he approaches to darkness. The further the soul goes from God, the nearer it approaches to misery. Second, sin is a walking contrary to God. Leviticus 26.27 The same word in the Hebrew signifies both to commit sin and to rebel. Sin is God's opposite. If God be of one mind, sin will be of another. If God says, sanctify the Sabbath, sin says, profane it. Sin strikes at God's very being. If sin could help it, God should no longer be God. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Isaiah 30 verse 11 What a horrible thing this is for a piece of proud dust to rise up in defiance against its maker. 3. Sin is an injury to God. It violates His laws. Here is grievous high treason. What greater injury can be offered to a prince than to trample upon his royal edicts? A sinner offers contempt to the statute laws of heaven. They cast thy law behind their backs, Nehemiah 9.26, as if they scorn to look upon it. Sin robs God of his due. You injure a man when you do not give him his due. The soul belongs to God. He lays a double claim to it. It is his by creation and by purpose. Now sin steals the soul from God and gives the devil that which rightly belongs to God. 4. Sin is profound ignorance. The schoolmen say that all sin is founded in ignorance. If men knew God in his purity and justice, they would not dare go on in the course of sinning. They proceed from evil to evil, and they know me not, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 9 verse 3. Therefore, ignorance and lust are joined together. 1 Peter 1.14 Ignorance is the womb of lust. Vapors arise most in the night. The black vapors of sin arise most in a black, ignorant soul. Satan casts a mist before a sinner so that he does not see the flaming sword of God's wrath. The evil eagle first rolls himself in the sand and then flies at the stag and by fluttering its wings so bedusts the stag's eyes that it cannot see, and then it strikes with its talons. So Satan, that eagle or prince of the air, first blinds men with ignorance, and then wounds them with his darts of temptation. Is sin ignorance? There is great cause to repent of ignorance. 5. Sin is a piece of desperateness. In every transgression a man runs an apparent hazard of his soul. He treads upon the brink of the bottomless pit. Foolish sinner, you never commit a sin, but you do that which may undo your soul forever. He who drinks poison, it is a wonder if it does not cost him his life. One taste of the forbidden tree lost Adam paradise. One sin of the angels lost them heaven. One sin of Saul lost him his kingdom. The next sin you commit, God may clap you up prisoner among the damned. You who gallop on in sin, it is a question whether God will spare your life a day longer or give you a heart to repent, so that you are desperate even, even to frenzy. 6. Sin besmears with filth. 
In James 1.21, it is called filthiness. The Greek word signifies the putrid matter of ulcers. Sin is called an abomination, Deuteronomy 7.25. Indeed, in the plural, abominations, Deuteronomy 20, verse 18. This filthiness is sin. This filthiness in sin is inward. A spot on the face may easily be wiped off, but to have the liver and lungs tainted is far worse. Such a pollution is sin. It has gotten into mind and conscience. Titus 1.15 It is compared to a menstruous cloth, Isaiah 30.22, the most unclean thing under the law. A sinner's heart is like a field spread with dung. Some think sin an ornament. It is rather an excrement. Sin so besmears a person with filth that, ga- that God cannot abide the sight of him. My soul loathed them. Zechariah 11, verse 8. 7. In sin there is odious ingratitude. God has fed you, O sinner, with angels' food. He has crowned you with a variety of mercies. Yet do you go on in sin? As David said of Nabal, In vain have I kept this man's sheep. 1 Samuel 25, verse 21. Likewise in vain has God done so much for all for the sinner. All God's mercies may upbraid, yea, accuse the ungrateful person. God may say, I gave you wit, health, riches, and you have employed all these against me. I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Hosea 2, verse 8. I sent in provisions, and they served their idols with them. The snake in the fable which was frozen stung him that brought it to the fire and gave it warmth. So a sinner goes about to sting God with his own mercies. Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Second Samuel 16:17. Did God give you life to sin? Did he give you wages to serve the devil? 8. Sin is a debasing thing. It degrades a person of his honor. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Nahum 1.14 This was spoken of a king. He was not vile by birth, but by sin. Sin blots our name, taints our blood. Nothing so changes a man's glory into shame as sin. It is said of Naaman, He was a great man and honorable, but he was a leper. 2 Kings 5 verse 1 Let a man be never so great with worldly pomp, yet if he be wicked he is a leper in God's eye. To boast of sin is to boast of that which is our infamy, as if a prisoner should boast of his fetters or be proud of his halter. Number 9. Sin is a damage. In every sin there is infinite loss. Never did any thrive by grazing, by grazing on this common. What does one lose? He loses God. He loses his peace. He loses his soul. The soul is a divine spark lighted from heaven. It is the glory of creation. And what can countervail this loss? Matthew 16, verse 26. If the soul be gone, the treasure is gone. Therefore, in sin there is infinite loss. Sin is such a trade that whoever follows it is sure to be ruined. 10. Sin is a burden. Mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. Psalm 38 verse 4. The sinner goes with his weights and fetters on him. The burden of sin is always worst when it is the least felt. Sin is a burden wherever it comes. Sin burdens God. I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. Amos 2.13 Sin burdens the soul. What a weight did Spira feel? Footnote Spira was an eminent lawyer living near Venice in the Reformation period of the 16th century. He turned from Romanism, accepted the Protestant faith, but later apostatized and died in despair in 1548. His life was published in Geneva in 1550, John Calvin supplying a preface. John Bunyan was deeply impressed by what had happened to Spira, the man in the iron cage in the interpreter's house in Pilgrim's Progress, undoubtedly represents him. End of footnote. 
How was the conscience of Judas burdened so much so that he hanged himself to quiet his conscience? They that know what sin is will repent that they carry such a burden. 11. Sin is a debt. It is compared to a debt of 10,000 talents. Matthew 18.24 Of all the debts we owe, our sins are the worst. With other debts, a sinner may flee to foreign parts, but with sin he cannot. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? Psalm 139, verse 7 God knows where to find out all his debtors. Death frees a man from other debts, but it will not free him from this. It is not the death of the debtor, but of the creditor that discharges this debt. 12. There is deceitfulness in sin. Hebrews 3.13 The wicked worketh a deceitful work. Proverbs 11.18 Sin is a mere cheat. While it pretends to please us, it beguiles us. Sin does as Jael did. First she brought the milk and butter to Sisera, then she struck the nail through his temple so that he died. Judges 5.26 Sin first courts and then kills. It is first a fox and then a lion. Whoever sin kills, it betrays. Those locusts in the Revelation are the perfect hieroglyphics and emblems of sin. On their heads were, as it were, like crowns of gold, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and there were stings in their tails. Revelation 9, verse 7 through 10. Sin is like the usurer, who feeds a man with money and then makes him mortgage his land. Sin feeds the sinner with delightful objects and then makes him mortgage his soul. Judas pleased himself with the thirty pieces of silver, but they proved deceitful riches. Ask him now how he likes his bargain. 13. Sin is a spiritual sickness. One man is sick of pride, another of lust, another of malice. It is with a sinner as it is with a sick patient. His palate is distempered, and the sweetest things taste bitter to him. So the word of God, which is sweeter than the honeycomb, tastes bitter to a, sin a sinner. They put sweet for bitter, Isaiah 5, verse 20. And if sin be a disease, it is not to be cherished, but rather cured by repentance. 14. Sin is a bondage. It binds a man apprentice to the devil. Of all conditions, servitude is the worst. Every man is held with the cords of his own sin. I was held before conversion, said Augustine, not with an iron chain, but with the obstinacy of my will. Sin is imperious and tyrannical. It is called a law, Romans 8, 2, because it has such a binding power over a man. The sinner must do as sin will have him. He does not so much enjoy his lusts as serve them, and he will have work enough to do to gratify them all. I have seen princes going on foot, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 7. The soul, that princely thing, which did once sit in a chair of state and was crowned with knowledge and holiness, is now made a lackey to sin and run the devil's errand. 15. Sin has a spreading malignity, mal malignity in it. It does hurt not only to a man's self, but to others. One man's sin may occasion many to sin, as one beacon being lighted may occasion all the beacons in the country to be lighted. One man may help to defile many. A person who has the plague going into company does not know how many will be infected with the plague by him. You who are guilty of open sins know not how many have been infected by you. There may be many, for aught you know, now in hell, crying out that they would have never come hither if it had not been for your bad example. 16. Sin is a vexatious thing. It brings trouble with it. The curse which God laid upon the woman is most truly laid upon every sinner. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth. Genesis 3.16 A man vexes his thoughts with plotting sin, and when sin has conceived, in sorrow he brings forth. Like one who takes a great deal of pain to open a floodgate, when he has opened it, the floods come in upon him and drowns him. So a man beats his brains to contrive sin, and then it vexes his conscience, brings crosses to his estate, rots the wall and timber of his house. Zechariah 5 verse 4 
17. Sin is an absurd thing. What greater indiscretion is there than to gratify an enemy? Sin gratifies Satan. When lust or anger burn in the soul, Satan warms himself at the fire. Men's sins feast the devil. Samson was called out to make the lords of the Philistines sports. Sport. Judges 16.25 Likewise the sinner makes the devil sport. It is meat and drink to him to see men sin. How he laughs, to see them venturing their souls for the world, as if one should venture for diamonds, should venture diamonds for straw, or should fish for gudgeons with golden hooks. Every wicked man shall be indicted for a fool at the day of judgment. 18. There is cruelty in every sin. With every sin you commit, you give a stab to your soul. While you are kind to sin, you are cruel to yourself, like the man in the gospel who cut himself with stones till the blood came. Mark 5, verse 5. The sinner is like the jailer who drew a sword to kill himself. Acts 16, 27. The soul may cry out, I am murdering. Naturalists say the hawk chews to drink blood rather than water, so sin drinks the blood of souls. 19. Sin is a spiritual death, dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 verse 1. Augustine said that before his conversion, reading of the death of Ditto, he could not refrain from, re- from weeping. But wretch that I was, said he, I bewailed the death of Ditto, forsaken by Aeneas, and did not bewail the death of my soul, forsaken of God. The life of sin is the death of the soul. Footnote Ditto is the legendary founder of Carthage, who stabbed herself to death because she could not obtain Aeneas as her husband in the 10th century B.C. End of footnote A dead man has no sense, so an unregenerate person has no sense of God in him. Ephesians 4.19 Persuade him to make... Persuade him to mind his salvation... To what purpose do you make orations to a dead man? Go to reprove him for vice? To what purpose do you strike a dead man? He who is dead has no taste. Set a banquet before him, and he does not relish it. Likewise, a sinner tastes no sweetness in Christ or a promise. They are but as cordials in a dead man's mouth. The dead putrefy, and if Martha said of Lazarus, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. John 11:39. How much more may we say of a wicked man, who has been dead in sin for thirty or forty years, by this time he stinketh. 20. Sin without repentance tends to final damnation. As the rose perishes by the canker bred in itself, so do men by the corruptions which breed in their souls. What was once said to the Grecians of the Trojan horse, this engine is made to be the destruction of your city, the same may be said to every impenitent person. This engine of sin will be the destruction of your soul. Sin's last scene is is always tragic. Diagoras Florentinus would drink poison in a frolic, but it cost him his life. Men drink the poison of sin in a merriment, but it costs them their souls. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 What Solomon said of wine may be also said of sin. At first it giveth his color in the cup. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Proverbs 23 verse 31 and 32 Christ tells us of the worm and the fire. Mark 9.48 Sin is like oil, and God's wrath is like fire. As long as the damned continue sinning, so the fire will continue scorching, and who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Isaiah 33:14. But men question the truth of this, and are like impious Devonax, who being threatened with hell for his villainies, mocked at it and said, I will believe there is a hell when I come there and not before. We cannot make hell enter into men till they enter into hell. Thus we have seen the deadly evil in sin, which seriously considered may make us repent and turn to God. 
If for all this men will persist in sin and are resolved upon a voyage to hell, who can help it? They have been told what a soul-damning rock sin is, but if they will voluntarily run upon it and split themselves, their blood be upon their own head. The second serious consideration to work repentance is to consider the mercies of God. A stone is soonest broken upon a soft pillow, and a heart of stone is soonest broken upon the soft pillow of God's mercies. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4 The clemency of a prince sooner causes relenting in a malefactor. While God has been storming others in his judgments, he has been wooing you by his mercies. First, what private mercies have we had? What mischiefs, mischiefs have been prevented? What fears blown over? When our foot has been slipping, God's mercy has held us up. Psalm 94.18 Mercy has always been a screen between us and danger. When enemies like lions have risen up against us to devour us, free grace has snatched us out of the mouth of these lions. In the deepest waves the arm of mercy has been under and has kept our head above water. And will not this privative mercy lead us to repentance? Second, what positive mercies have we had? Firstly, in supplying mercy. God has been a bountiful benefactor. The God which fed me all my life long unto this day. Genesis 48.15 What man will spread a table for his enemy? We have been enemies, yet God has fed us. He has given us the horn of oil. He has made the honeycomb of mercy drop on us. God has been as kind to us as if we had been his best servants. And will not this supplying mercy lead us to repentance? Secondly, in delivering mercy. When we have been at the gates of the grave, God has miraculously spun out our lives. He has turned the shadow of death into mourning and has put a song of deliverance into our mouth. And will not delivering mercy lead us to repentance? The Lord has labored to break our hearts with his mercies. In Judges chapter 2, we read that when the angel, which was a prophet, had preached a sermon of mercy, the people lifted up their voice and wept. Verse 4. If anything will move tears, it should be the mercy of God. He is an obstinate sinner indeed, whom these great capable, these great cable ropes of God's mercy will not draw to repentance. Third, in the third place, consider God's afflictive providences and see if our limbeck will not drop when the fire is put under. God has sent us in recent years to the school of the cross. He has twisted his judgments together. He has made good upon us those two threatenings. I will be to Ephraim as a moth. Hosea 5.12 Has not God been so to England in the decay of trading? And I will be unto Ephraim as a lion. Hosea 5.14 Has he not been so to England in the devouring plague? That is the plague of 1665. All this while God waited for our repentance. But we went on in sin. I hearkened and heard, but no man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Jeremiah 8.6 And of later God has been whipping us with a fiery rod in those tremendous flames in this city that is, the great fire of London in 1666, which were emblematic of the great conflagration at the last day when the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 2 Peter 3 verse 10 When Job's corn was on fire, then he went running to Absalom. 2 Samuel 14.31 God has set our houses on fire that we may run to him in repentance. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Micah 6, verse 9. This is the language of the rod, that we should humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and break off our sins by righteousness. Daniel 4, 27. Manasseh's affliction ushered in repentance. 2 Chronicles 33, 12. This God uses as the proper medicine for security. Their mother hath played the harlot, Hosea 2, 5, by idolatry. What course now will God take with her? Therefore I will hedge up thy way with thorns. Hosea 2.6 
This is God's method, to set a thorn hedge of affliction in the way. Thus, to, prou- to a proud man, contempt is a thorn. To a lustful man, sickness is a thorn, both to stop him in his sin and to prick him forward in repentance. The Lord teaches his people as Gideon did the men of Succoth. He took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth, Judges 8.16. Here was tearing rhetoric. Likewise, God has of late been teaching us humiliation by thorny providences. He has torn our golden fleece from us. He has brought our houses low that he might bring our hearts low. When shall we dissolve into tears if not now? God's judgments are so proper a means to work repentance that the Lord wonders at it and makes it his complaint that his severity did not break men off from their sins. I have withholden the rain from you, Amos 4.7. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew, Amos 4.9. I have sent among you the pestilence, Amos 4.10. But still this is the burden of the complaint. Ye have not returned to me. The Lord proceeds gradually in his judgments. Firstly, he sends a lesser cross, and if that will not do, then a greater. He sends upon one a gentle fit of an og to begin with, and afterwards a burning fever. He sends upon another a loss at sea, then the loss of a child, then of a husband. Thus by degrees he tries to bring men to repentance. Sometimes God makes his judgments go in circuit, from family to family. The cup of affliction has gone round the nation. All have tasted it. And if we repent not now, we stand in contempt of God, and by implication we bid God do his worst. Such a climax of wickedness will hardly be pardoned. In that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning, and behold joy and gladness. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die. Isaiah 22, verse 12 through 14. That is, this sin shall not be expiated by sacrifice. If the Romans severely punished a young man who in a time of public calamity was seen sporting in a window with a crown of roses on his head, of how much sore punishment shall they be thought worthy who strengthen themselves in wickedness and laugh in the very face of God's judgments. The heathen mariners in a storm repented, Jonah 1.14. Not to repent now and throw our sins overboard is to be considered worse than heathens. Fourthly, let us consider how much we shall have to answer for at last if we repent not, how many prayers, counsels, and admonitions will be put upon the score. Every sermon will come in as an indictment. As for such as have truly repented, Christ will answer for them. His blood will wash away their sins. The mantle of free grace will cover them. In those days, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. Those who have judged themselves in the lower court of conscience shall be acquitted in the higher court of heaven. But if we repent not, our sins must be all accounted for at the last day, and we must answer for them in our own persons with no counsel allowed to plea for us. O impenitent sinner, think with yourself now how you will be able to look your judge in the face. You have a damned cause to plead and will be sure to be cast at the bar. What then shall I do when God riseth up, and when he visiteth? What shall I answer him? Job 31, verse 14. Therefore, either repent now, or else provide your answers, and see what defense you can make for yourselves when you come before God's tribunal. But when God rises up, how will you answer him? Footnote for the sentence, will be sure to be cast at the bar, means rejected at the bar of judgment. End of footnote. Chapter 12 Prescribing some means for repentance. 2. Compare penitent and impenitent conditions. The second help to repentance is a prudent prudent comparison. Compare penitent and impenitent conditions together and see the difference. 
spread them before your eyes and by the light of the word see the impenitent condition as most deplorable and the penitent as most comfortable. How sad was it with the prodigal before he returned to his father. He had spent all. He had sinned himself into beggary and left and had nothing left but a few husks. He was a co- fellow commoner with the swine, but when he came home to his father, nothing was thought too good for him. The robe was brought forth to cover him, the ring to adorn him, and the fatted calf to feast him. If the sinner continues in his impenitency, then farewell Christ in mercy. But if he repent, then presently he has a heaven within him. Then Christ is his, then all is peace. He may sing a requiem to his soul and say, Soul, take thine ease, thou hast much goods laid up. Luke 12:19. Upon our turning to God, we have more restored to us in Christ than ever was lost in Adam. God says to the repenting soul, I will clothe thee with the robe of righteousness. I will enrich thee with the jewels and graces of my spirit. I will bestow my love upon thee. I will give thee a kingdom. Son, all I have is thine. O my friends, do but compare your estate before repentance and after repentance together. Before your repenting, there are nothing but clouds to be seen and storms clouds in God's face and storms in conscience. But after repenting, how is the weather altered? What sunshine above? What serene calmness within? A Christian soul being like the hill Olympus, which is in Greek mythology the home of the gods, all light and clear and no winds blowing. A third means conducive to repentance is a settled determination to leave sin. Not a faint velleity, but a resolved vow. I have sworn that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Psalm 119, 106. All the delights and artifices of sin shall not make me forsworn. There must be no hesitation, no consulting with flesh and blood. Had I best leave my sin or no? But as Ephraim, what have I to do any more with idols? Hosea 14, 8. I will be galled no more by my sins, no longer fooled by Satan. This day I will put a bill of divorce into the hands of my lusts. Till we come to this peremptory resolution, sin will get ground of us and we shall never be able to shake off this viper. It is no wonder that he who is not resolved to be an enemy of sin is conquered by it. But this resolution must be built upon the strength of Christ more than our own. It must be a humble resolution as David, when he went against Goliath, put off his presumptuous confidence as well as his armor. I come to thee in the name of the Lord God, 1 Samuel 17.45. So we must go out against our Goliath lusts in the strength of Christ. It is usual for a person to join another in the bond with him. So, being conscious of our own inability to leave sin, let us get Christ to be bound with us and engage his strength for the mortifying of corruption. The fourth means conducive to repentance is earnest supplication. The heathens laid one of their hands on the plow, and the other they lifted up to Cyrus, the goddess of corn. So when we have used the means, let us look up to God for a blessing. Pray to him for a repenting heart. Thou Lord who bidst me repent, give me grace to repent. Pray that our hearts may be holy limbecks, dropping tears. Beg of Christ to give to us such a look of love as he did to Peter, which made him go out and weep bitterly. Implore the help of God's Spirit. It is the Spirit smiting on the rock of our hearts that makes the waters gush out. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. Psalm 147.18 When the wind of God's Spirit blows, then the water of tears will flow. There is good reason we should to God. There is good reason we should to God for repentance. One, because it is his gift. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Acts 11:18. The Arminians hold that it is in our power to repent. We can harden our hearts, but we cannot soften them. This crown of free will is fallen from our head. Nay, there is in us not only impotency, but obstinacy. Acts 7.51 
Therefore beg of God a repentant spirit. He can make the stony heart bleed. His is a word of creative power. Second, we must have a recourse to God for blessing because He has promised to bestow it. I will give you an heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36.26 I will soften your adamant hearts in my son's blood. Show God his hand and seal. And there is another gracious promise. They shall return unto me with their whole heart. Jeremiah 24.7 Turn this promise into a prayer. Lord, give me grace to return unto thee with my whole heart. The fifth means conducive to repentance is endeavor after clearer discoveries of God. Now mine eye hath, now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, verse 5 and 6. Job, having surveyed God's glory and purity, as a humble penitent did abhor, or as it is in the Hebrew, did even reprobate himself. By looking into the transparent glass of God's holiness, we see our own blemishes and so learn to bewail them. Lastly, we should labor for faith. But, but what is that to repentance? Yes, faith breeds union with Christ and there can be no separation from sin till there be union with Christ. The eye of faith looks on mercy and that thaws the heart. Faith carries us to Christ's blood and that blood mollifies. Faith persuades of the love of God and that love sets us a-weeping. Thus I have laid down the means or helps to repentance, what remains now but that we set upon the work, and let us be earnest, not as fencers, but as warriors. I will conclude all with the words of the psalmist, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126 Verse 6.